Okay, so um, so we're talking this morning between me and Jonathan about um, wilderness and contemplation and activism. So um, having listened and talked a bit to the people who've started us off in, in wilderness, there's some, um, it seems to me, and this is kind of inevitable, that when we think about wilderness, especially in Christian terms, and especially during Lent, that there's a particular picture of wilderness that comes to mind. So it's, it's that barren place that's filled with rocks and sand and animals that usually come with some sort of a threat. And it's not surprising that that's the picture that we see, because I guess even if we haven't visited, we've seen pictures of the Judean wilderness that was the place that Jesus probably was in the stories like him being tempted by the devil. But if I find myself reading something uh, like The Week, which we get in our house, and you get adverts for expensive holidays, and I see that there's a disconnect between that traditional Christian view of the wilderness and the view that offers at vast expense, usually, the wilderness experience that it seems that lots of people are looking for. Um, I looked up the word wilderness and uh, it comes from an old English word, the way that we use it. And it simply means land inhabited only by the wild animals, somewhere where there are no people, the sort of place that you might go to be alone. And whereas that place might be scary and threatening, my feeling is that it might also be very beautiful. So if I can screen share a bit, I'm going to start us off this morning in a beautiful wilderness. Can you see this? Somebody unmute themselves and tell me if you can see. Oh, hang on. What's going on here? It's all bright and clear. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. are we are we currently in the Cairngorms? That's uh, with that's flowers. Good, that's a good place to be. It's um, it's cotton grass. It's it's very lovely stuff. It, so that this is um, this is on the edge of the Cairngorms, and um, if I can now find the words that I want, which have disappeared, I shall um, I shall tell you about them. So um. This is somewhere that, that I go on holiday quite a lot. And um, I haven't seen a lot of wild animals there, I would have to admit. But it is a really good place for just being without anybody else. There is, if this will let me change the picture. So th this was sunrise at about um, five o'clock one, one summer morning a couple of years ago. There's a bothy where you can sleep if you want to but um, really best only to be in it if it's raining, it's much nicer outside. And it's a great place for a bit of contemplative prayer, I would say. So when I head off to this place on my own, um, I don't take anything that will distract me. I do, as is obvious, take my camera, but personally I find that an aid to contemplation rather than a distraction. I find that the place and the camera just help me to, to slow down, to really look at what's around me, to sit still, and hopefully to really see and experience what's about. Slightly different place, but same idea. There's a um, Carmelite contemplative, William McNamara, and he he's came out with this awesome line. I'm not sure whether it was in a book or what, but um, he said, contemplation is about taking a long, loving look at what is real. It is a gorgeous place. But thankfully, and I am very thankful for this, as Scotland is such a long way away, it's not essential to go to the Cairngorms to experience that. So... This is a bit of alone in the wilderness of my garden in the spring, a day when I spent quite a long time, oh, hang on, not that one, um, quite a long time lying on my tummy watching crocuses. Do you see a crocus? So um, 
I started off quite early in the morning and um, I watched as the sun began to make the crocuses open. They go to sleep at night to a certain extent. And um, I watched as a variety of bugs began to visit the flowers. I looked closely at what makes a purple crocus purple and realized just how much of a purple crocus is not in fact purple at all. And then, joy of joys, a bumblebee turned up. I watched as it climbed up the outside and into the middle of the flower. I watched, and you can just see in this picture, I watched as it stuck its tongue out to collect the nectar that's going to feed itself and maybe the rest of its colony if it's that sort of a bee. I watched as it moved around inside the flower. and then emerged half covered in golden pollen before flying away, presumably to repeat the process somewhere else. I find that when I take time for that long loving look at what is real, that what I find is not only awe and wonder at creation, but also a deep sense of connection Connection with the natural world, yes, and connection with the God who made it. And then I find that because of that sense of connection and the love with which I have been looking, that I begin to care deeply and that that changes me. I see the beauty. I let it touch the depths of my being. And because of that, I can't walk away any longer and I'm compelled into some sort of action. There was uh, a lady called Nan Shepherd who did lots of writing, but she spent 40 years of her life living, looking, walking, writing about the Cairngorms. And she said this, however long I walk on them, these hills hold astonishment for me. There's no getting used to them. So for me, perhaps what makes, or part of what makes a contemplative activist is simply sitting and looking and allowing ourselves to be transformed by what we see and letting that con transformation compel us into some sort of action. So um, I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan now to do a bit of talking and um, he's gonna talk about a different sort of sitting. So I'm, go I'm going to say something really about, about sitting, about sitting in prayer, in con contemplation, and sitting in protest. We hear that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain and sat down and began to teach. So here I am. I'm at another Insulate Britain action and sitting down again. I'm sitting cross-legged on the ground, trying to keep calm, flanked on either side with other determined roadblockers. We don't talk though, just keep silent, staring ahead, focusing on a fixed point, feeling the cold seep in from the ground. We notice the anger, the chaos we've created, hearing the horns, the constant swearing, the occasionally more nuanced. We sympathise with your cause, but this isn't the way to achieve your aims. I feel scared, guilty, but determined to stay seated, stay focused. You know, it would be easier to stand up and talk to people, talk to the assembled media, be distracted. But it's not what I'm called to do. What I've pledged to do is just sit, do nothing, be powerless, just wait and surrender to the present moment. So I sit. Blocking a road like, non-violently like this, I would suggest can be a form of contemplative prayer. Gently going to ground, lowering your voice, making calm and slow movements are also an entree to prayer, sitting, doing nothing,
keeping still, focused, listening to your breathing, noticing the many distractions, which are usually more psychological than physical, but refusing to give in to them. That's what a lot of my prayer is about. On the road, it's the blast of horns and raised voices. In the chapel, they're the inner voices of distraction. Sitting in protest and in content, contemplative prayer can feel like a waste of time. It's hard to measure the outcomes of either. But both, I believe, can be a work of transformation in the, sit, in the sitter. Both demand a kind of humility and a willingness to surrender. One to the powers of law and order, the other to a higher power. Sitting still is an act of rebellion against the tendency to be busy, productive, achieving, something that seems almost hardwired into the minds and lives of so many of us. Blocking a motorway is a direct challenge to this life of constant striving and continuous movement that's the vehicle for 20th century capitalism. Contemplative prayer too can seem a waste of time to those whose mantra, time is money. To spend time doing nothing is profoundly countercultural, as is to surrender your autonomy and let go of conscious thought. The great gift of this kind of prayer is that in surrendering all and abandoning our own agency, we can begin to live in a place of great freedom. And in that place, that sense of everything belongs. We begin to understand what Master Eckhart meant when he said, the spiritual life is much more about subtraction than addition. Being dragged away by the police, handcuffed, stripped of your possessions and locked in a cell, for me are outward signs of this abandonment to God that is the starting point for contemplative prayer. Once you've been arrested and given into the hands of the police, you do surrender a huge amount of autonomy. As Jesus says to Peter at the end of John's Gospel, when you were young, you fastened your belt around you and walked where you chose. But when you're old, you will stretch out your arms and a stranger will bind you fast and carry you where you have no wish to go. If contemplative prayer is about submission, then non-violent civil disobedience can lead us to understand this more fully. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus brings the two together. Not my will, but yours be done. Is Jesus abandoning himself into God's hands? just before he non-violently and willingly gives himself into the hands of the temple guards. Sitting on the ground can evoke humility and remind us it is from dust you came and to dust you shall return. And it's of course the rich hummus or topsoil that all human life depends on for food and sustenance. When I sit in a roadblock or in a prayer vigil, I think there's no difference between the two because one feeds the other. Sitting enables a subtle shift away from the, prost of, prot from the protest of standing up for the earth and all the attendant temptations to be seen as virtuous or an eco-warrior. It encourages my ego to get out of the way and the power of God to work through my weakness. Living out of what John, John the Baptist says, he must increase, I must decrease. Sitting reminds me that I'm really quite small and powerless. But paradoxically, this can lead to a greater sense of dependence of God on the power and the power of God. In Luke 10, it's not Martha's, Martha's activism that Jesus commends, but Mary sitting and listening. But I think in prayer and protest, we can bind the two, one feeds the other. Sitting reminds me that if I want to change the world, 
and the way the world is, and to confront the principalities and powers at work in our death-dealing economic system. I need to be transformed too. So I sit. And now back to you, Hilary. Thank you. So, um, yeah, D different people, different experiences, obviously. But um, for me, I'm sort of going back to Luke chapter five, where that this is the contemporary English version translation. He says, um, Jesus would often go to some place where he could be alone and pray. And that says to me that Jesus knew what all rebels know or should know, that, um, that regen is important. I know that not everyone's experience will be the same as mine and that not all of us do regen the same way. And obviously that's fine. But for me, contemplation is a big part of it. There's a great story about a priest who sees an old man come into his church every day. The old man just comes in and sits down for quite a long time, doesn't appear to pray or talk or do anything. And after watching him for quite a while, the priest goes to the old man and says, you know, what, what is it that you do in church every day? And the old man says, I just sit and look at God. And the priest is a bit confused by this. So he says, and what does God do? And the man answers, God looks at me. I think taking time out to sit quietly and alone, simply gazing on God and letting him gaze back at us can be hugely resourcing, a real part of regen. It can ground us, grow our roots, build our resilience for when we go back out into action again, if that's what we do. And that doesn't simply mean spending a week or two at a rebellion and then going home and needing to crash out quietly for the following week to get over it. It can also mean finding half an hour within the rebellion to just go off for a quiet cup of tea somewhere and really savour it, concentrate on it, enjoy it to the, you know, blocking out everything else, just contemplatively drinking your cup of tea, or perhaps taking five minutes to sit with your eyes closed and you're back against a tree in Parliament Square. Contemplation, I think, creates a sustainable culture. It sustains us. It reminds us of why we do what we do. And it prepares us both for present protest and for whatever the future might hold and for the uncertainty that there is within that. Thomas Merton talked quite a lot about the way that when a person withdraws from the world, and he wasn't just talking about religious community, that they're not insulating themselves from the reality of the world, but through contemplative prayer, they're actually becoming closer to the reality of the world, doing less in order to become a more involved part of everything. And that's deeply countercultural, isn't it? In this world that's all about capitalism, consumerism, growth, more, stopping and doing nothing or seeming to do nothing is a huge challenge to what's considered normal. We see that when, when we keep vigil and people stop to ask what we're doing and quite often they're surprised, but also quite often their reaction is really positive as if they, they get what we're doing and see something in it that they might want, but don't quite know how to go about it. When um, Jesus talks to his disciples in John 17, he talks about being in the world, but not of it. And when we choose contemplative prayer, I think we embody that idea of being in the world, but not of it. Whether we're alone on a mountainside, at home, in the garden with a load of crocuses, or in a more public place like the vigil where some of us have been in the last two weeks. 
And um, I'm going to hand back over to Jonathan at that point. Yeah, just, just, a, just a few more thoughts. I think it's really important to say that, I don't know, I don't find contempt of the player easy, doing nothing easy. It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, I don't think it's something you can ever be good at, really, or because it's not about achieving. It's just about being, it's about being faithful. And I see connections there about protest. Um, we're not sure where, whether we're going to achieve anything. We don't always see immediate outcomes, but but slowly, my experience is through, through, through prayer, that prayer of doing nothing, yeah, transformation comes. So inner transformation, outer transformation, that's the connection for me. Um, yeah, and I find that protest feeds my prayer um, in a funny sort of way. Um, yeah, that idea of, yeah, uh, yeah, I suppose getting arrested, handing yourself over. Uh, it's a kind of metaphor for, for, for prayer. And I think contemplative prayer can revitalize us, uh, give us new energy, and it helps us unmask evil and challenges our false self, the desire to put ourselves, uh, you know, at the centre of everything. It's a lovely quotation from Thomas Merton I, I dug out the other day, uh, which, which is so, well, so contemporary now. He says this, Unless we fight against war, both in ourselves and in the Russians, he's, he's writing during the Cold War, of course, we are purely and simply going to be wrecked by the forces that are in us. So I think to be sustained as activists, protesters, lovers of the earth, then, yeah, we need to... We need to do the inner work and let God do the inner work uh, within us. I, I'll only find the courage and resolve to keep protesting through keeping that loving gaze on God's creation and really knowing that an injury to the earth is an injury to me. Contemplation allows me to feel feel and know that everything belongs as it is and is interconnected it encourages me to challenge that false narrative of separation separation of us between other people and our separation uh, from the earth which is too often seen as a commodity to be used up having stillness periods of stillness each day fires me up and gives me the energy to keep acting, be prepared to think what's next. It gives courage, it gives hope. And it reminds me it's okay not to know what will happen next, which allows me to take risks. Praying, keeping vigil in Parliament Square, or protesting beneath the shiny tower blocks of the city of London, for me, replays the civil resistance of Jesus, who in Holy Week enters Jerusalem, that place of state and religious power. But even during that week, he finds times of stillness in Bethany, in Gethsemane, in him the active and the contemplative, of course, are one. And as Hilary said, throughout his ministry, huge amounts of activity are balanced by solitary prayer, seeking that place of quiet, of wilderness. And if, like him, we're standing up to governments and corporations and even the church, we need to find the protection an inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which is infuses this kind of humble and simple prayer. 
I just wanted to end with a quote by Elizabeth Jennings, who she, and she's thinking about John of the Cross, um, Carmelite friar. Uh, and she says this of him and prayer. It is held in being by patience, by watching, suffering beyond signs or words not your light either you are receiver requirer and when the flame falters nothing of yours can revive it you are resigned to the darkness but you open your eyes to the world So Hillary's now going to, um, I think, get us into some breakout groups and maybe we've got some questions too. A poem by, um, by a bit of Rilke to end with. You sent out beyond your recall go to the limits of your longing embody me flare up like flame and make big shadows i can move in let everything happen to you beauty and terror just keep going no feeling is final don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. Amen.